Good morning. Hello, good morning and welcome on this beautiful Sunday. Well, a bit blustery, a bit cloudy, but nevertheless, a beautiful Sunday. My name is Mornay and it's an absolute joy to be with you this morning. As Dan just said, I have the pleasure uh, this morning in bringing our preaching series Resilient to its conclusion. And I just loved these last 12 weeks. We have been blessed with some really solid and encouraging teaching. The Apostle Paul walked us through this book of Ephesians, teaching us just how to be a resilient people. Today, we are looking at probably one of the most famous and one of the most often quoted pieces of scripture in the Bible. And these verses are so rich and we could probably do an entire series on its own. But I'm going to do my best this morning and just pull out a few key points. So I would encourage you to go and study this, study these verses, 10 verses or so, eight verses in your quiet time and really apply them. There's so much, it's such a rich test. But before we do so, I'm just gonna pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you that you are with us. Lord, Holy Spirit, we just pray, would you come into every household? Will you come into everywhere, every device is tuned into this stream. We just pray, Lord, that you will be there with those people, that you will be with the family. We'll, that here we will be with people who's joined us for the first time. Lord God, we need your help. We need your strength, Lord. And I just pray a blessing over every family this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. To put it into perspective, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote two volumes on these eight verses, totaling some 700 pages. However, as I mentioned, I'm going to do my best to pull out a few critical points which is of critical importance for us as the body of Christ. Now the book of Ephesians, as Hazel mentioned last week, is it's cut into two pieces, arranged into two pieces. Chapters one to three is Paul's summary of God's blessed work in Jesus Christ and what that means for us. And then chapter four to six, Paul gives us instructions of how we should now live or walk in a faithful relationship with God in our daily lives. Now, Paul knew that living out the instructions that he was giving would not be easy. So he adds this whole armor of God passage to give the Ephesian Christians and us the spiritual resource to do what is required. As I mentioned earlier, this is one of the most quoted few verses of the whole Bible. So it does deserve some special attention. Well, people quote it because it addresses real life issues. And we live in a world where the rulers of darkness and the spiritual force of evil dominate people's lives, many people's lives. And what we see is it reflects and have an influence in our culture and our society. So life spring for us to be, for us to walk in the manner of our calling, for us to be a resilient family who stands firm in the wake of the onslaught of the enemy in these evil days, for us to do this, make no mistake, we need help. We need God's help. So let's pick it up in chapter 6, verse 10 to 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual force of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith and which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Wow, what a piece of scripture. Now, Paul is saying that everything I taught you throughout this book to walk in the manner 
worthy of our calling to which we have been called to do this. We need to be strong in the Lord. Everything we heard the last few weeks, resilience, about resilience, it comes down to this passage. Now, I love this passage, not only for the sound advice and the theological truth, but also for the metaphor Paul uses. It is all about strength. It's about might, about soldiers. It's arousing, it is interesting, and it's a crystal clear way of bringing this to life, especially as he's explaining to us that we are in a battle every day. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's comparing us to soldiers and telling us our lives as Christians are about warfare. Now, I don't want to scare us today, but that is a fact of the matter. When we gave our life to Jesus, the enemy is constantly attacking us. Now, this issue of strength is so important. We see it over and over again, especially here in Ephesians. Paul talks about strengthening the inner man in Ephesians 3.16. We must be strong, but we must understand where the strengths come from. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Friends, it isn't our strength. The apostle is not saying, come on, let's build muscle, let's get fit, let's recruit big, strong women and men. He's not saying that. That's not the kind of strength he's talking about. It is in the Lord. It is the Lord's strength in you. His strength is made perfect in our weakness, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. So the apostle, the apostle is calling us to experience a strength that is not our own in this whole issue of spiritual warfare. You are aware, some of you might be aware of my background in the armed forces. And I worked hard to be the best I could be. I trained hard. I was fit, might not look now, but I was fit. I could walk or run forever. I worked my body strength to be able to jump, crawl, climb, wrestle, and also to carry heavy loads far, if I had to carry a buddy, you see, and never to give up. And then we also worked at our mental health, our attitude, our condition. So I was in good shape and gave myself the best chance in any battle. But the thing is, I did not find my strength only in myself. I find my strength in my buddies and in my team. I could not fight the fight on my own. The same way we do not fight this battle against the rulers of darkness alone or in our strength, but we fight it in God's strength. We cannot fight the enemy on our own. I say that again, we cannot fight the enemy on our own. Consider this for a moment. In the beginning, God spoke the world into being. He said, let there be light, and light appeared to dispel darkness. A few more godly words brought into being an expanse in the middle of the waters and dry land and vegetation, and lights in the expanse of sky to divide day from the night, and swarms of living creatures and a person created in God's image, male and female. We see that in Genesis 1. Now, if a few godly words could accomplish all that, just imagine what God can do to empower us for the work that he calls us to do. When Paul talks us, uh, tells us to be strengthened in the strength of God's might, he's calling us to let God use some small part of his, that mighty power, to empower us to do what he has called us to do, to be what God has called us us to be, to be a strong, a steadfast and a resilient people, standing our ground and standing firm in the wake of the enemy's onslaught. We fight this battle in the strength of the Lord and by putting on his armour. But firstly, before we look at the armour, we must know our enemy. Brothers and sisters, Paul is not mincing his words here and we must heed his battle cry. Can you hear the bugle? Can you hear the trumpet sound? This is a call to arms and we must be ready and remain in this state of readiness and know who we are fighting. He uses the word schemes to, de to describe the enemy's plans and tactics. Other translations uses wiles or deceits. It's tricks, ruses, ploys, and they are deceiving. 
and they are constant. And we need to know how he operates. Now, I had the privilege to work alongside, in my opinion, some of the best trained soldiers on the planet. And let me tell you something. We made it our business to know our enemy and our opponent. Whether we work alongside serious crime detectors or with the intelligence community, we always knew the enemy well. We knew what their weapon of choice were, their tactics, their background. We knew their habits and what their purpose were. What was their end goal? Because when you know, when you know that, you know how to overcome and to stand firm. To know our enemy is vital in deterring or defeating him. So we must know how Satan operates. The Bible uses various names or titles for our enemy, such as the adversary, the devil, Satan, rulers of darkness or spiritual forces of evil. John Stott, the famous English theologian, said this. He says, they are spiritual hosts of wickedness, spiritual agents from the very headquarters of evil. They recognize no Geneva Convention to restrict or partially civilize the weapons of their warfare. They are utterly unscrupulous and ruthless in pursuit of their malicious designs. We cannot hide from it. This battle is real and we must know who we are up against. Peter warned in 1 Peter 5, 8, he says, the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, lions might roar, but they also stalk quietly and with great stealth, waiting for weakness and division. They don't always succeed in bringing down their prey, but they prowl relentlessly until their bellies are full. And when they begin to feel hungry again, they start the process all over again, looking for a new prey, striking again and again. In the same way, the devil, the adversary, pursues us relentlessly, skillfully assessing by what method he will most succeed in tempting us, whether we might be most easily persuaded to go an inch in the wrong direction or a whole mile. He's so crafty. In C.S. Lewis' novel, The Screwtape Letters, an experienced devil, Screwtape, is advising a young nephew named Wormwood who has been tasked with preventing a young man from becoming a Christian. And this is what he says. Screwtape says, murder is no better than cards if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. He is a deceiver and he is a liar and he is cunning and ever so crafty. We must be aware. One of Satan's most successful strategies has been to persuade people that he doesn't even exist. He is real and we must be aware of him and his plans. But be not afraid, brothers and sisters, because we have been given the Holy Spirit who lives within us who renews us, who strengthens us. And that assures us of our ultimate victory. Amen. But make no mistake, we are on a battle every day of our lives. But when we put our faith and our trust in Jesus, then we overcome. In him, we are overcomers. And John Newton captured this perfectly in one of his well-known hymns. And it goes like this. He says, Though many foes beset your road and feeble is your arm, your life is hid with Christ in God beyond the reach of harm. Weak as you are, you shall not faint or fainting shall not die. Jesus, the strength of every saint will aid you from on high. Though unperceived by mortal sense, faith sees him always near, a guide a glory, a defense, then what have you to fear? As surely as he overcame and triumphed once for you, so surely you that love his name shall in him triumph too. It is in the strength of Jesus that we fight this battle, friends. 
He has overcome death and won once and for all. But when he comes back, he will cast the enemy into the eternal fire. But until then, we are in a battle. And that is a fact. Sometimes this battle is messy and dirty and it will be tough. But not impossible because we find our strength in Jesus. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now by the power of the Holy Spirit, we stand firm and we fight and we oppose this enemy. Life Spring, we are a family and what does family do? We stand by each other. We have each other's backs. We fight alongside each other and carry each other if and when required. I ask again, can you hear the bugle? The trumpet is sounding. Are we a people that are ready for battle? Are we a family that will stand and fight the enemy together? So that's where we find our strength. We find it in the Lord, in Jesus. We're going to read, before we get on to our next point, we're actually going to look at the armor of God. I just want to read again from chapter 6, and we're going to look at verse 13 to 17. Just to remind ourselves, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Remember that Paul started this passage in verse 10 with finally, he's saying that after all that we've talked about, to stand firm, we need to put on the arm of God. If we want to do all these things that we've talked about and looked at in this series, to be a resilient people, to be a resilient church, we need the arm of God. We now know that we cannot do this in our own strength, but we can do all things through him who strengthens us so we can stand firm in these times. times of darkness and evil. God says this in Isaiah 40 verse 10, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now when we talk about the armor of God, we must take note that partial armor would leave us dangerously vulnerable. If a Roman soldier were to leave behind his breastplate or his boots or his shield, helmet or sword, his enemies would immediately target the place where he had failed to protect himself. Just so if you saw me back in the day in my unit in South Africa, you would think that all the kit we had were bits over the top. But we were protected and equipped for every eventuality and scenario to give us the best chance of success and survival for that matter. Our body armor, for example, was a Kevlar vest with a ballistic plate you slide in the front and in the back of the vest. Now this, this plate would protect our vital organs against larger caliber weapons that could easily pierce the normal vest on its own. The thing is, these plates were heavy, but we needed all of this equipment. And the same is true for this godly armor. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the sword and the word of God. Which one could we ignore without leaving ourselves vulnerable and exposed? Let us remind ourselves what the armor is and talk a bit more about that. The first one, the belt of truth. Truth is that which is real and untainted by falsehood. There is different kinds of truth. A person who avoids telling lies will gain a reputation as a truthful person. And that is what we are called to be. And it's also critical to our Christian witness. However, the greater truth is Jesus, the one in whom we believe and the one in whom we have staked our lives on. Jesus is truth personified, the way, the truth and the life, John 14, 6. And then Jesus promised, if you abide in my word, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free, John 8. 
Number two is the breastplate of righteousness. Our hope is based on grace, the righteousness given by Jesus, the righteousness that we could never have earned. Paul says in Philippians 3, 7, 9, after encountering Jesus, he says this, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Friends, I'm sure you notice this is only a breastplate. There is the back's exposed. There's no back plate. Now, I mentioned earlier that we, we, have, we used to carry heavy plates in our vest. The thing is, we never put one in the back because whatever I did, I did it in team. I did it with a buddy. Whenever I moved through a door or around a corner, I would do it in tandem, military position, in perfect harmony, always ensuring that my back is never exposed. And so it must be for us in the kingdom. We don't fight each other, we fight for each other. We have each other's backs. We don't need a plate in the back. When we see a brother or sister falter, fall or struggle, we cover them, we carry them, we support them. Come on, life spring. This, this is how we do family. The next one's the shoes of the gospel of peace. Paul's telling us that we need to prepare ourselves for encounters with wickedness and be ready to share the good news of peace. The Greek word for peace is Irene and the Hebrew is Shalom. Both can refer to an inner kind of peace, the kind of well-being that is der derived from a deep relationship with God. Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8.31. In other words, you could say, if God is for us, who cares who might be against us? Paul's point is that a close relationship with God bestows on the believer a confidence that cannot be shaken by any opponent or any danger. It would be appropriate to call that state of mind peace, Irene or Shalom. The next one is the shield of faith. In the New Testament, faith has to do with our response to the good news of Jesus Christ. In other words, Christian faith is faith in the Lord Jesus. Our lives are steered by and directed by him. We build our lives on this cornerstone, Jesus Christ. The picture of the shield is that of a large door-like shield. They were massive. And just as the Roman soldier would gain ultimate protection from his shield when he joined it to his fellow, fellow soldiers, so also the Christian faith gains its maximum value and strength when joined to the faith of fellow believers. Our faith reaches its optimum strength as we worship and pray together as the body of Christ and as a community of faith. That's how we build a resilient family. The helmet of salvation. Now this protects us from the enemy giving us that killer blow. Paul early in Ephesians described what salvation means and it comes from Ephesians 2 verse 4 to 5. He says, God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And then later in the same chapter, chapter uh, verse eight to nine, he says, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's a gift from God, not a result of works so that no one can boast. But the problem here is, is Satan tries to strike a knockout blow to our spiritual heads by causing us to doubt God, to doubt our salvation, to doubt that God has forgiven us, to doubt that God answers prayer, to doubt that he cares, to even doubt that God exists. And once Satan succeeds in planting a doubt, he then pries and persuades and cajoles to see if he can use that opening gambit 
to bring about the collapse of all our faith. Put on the helmet of your salvation, which is a gift from God. And then we look at the sword of the spirit. The sword is the primary weapon of the soldier. My pistol was mine. He uses this to go on the offense. He strike a blow, strikes a blow to the enemy. The sword is always readily available, as is the word of God. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The word of God is our primary weapon. Now, a lot of us take our physical health very serious and we should also take our spiritual health serious and study this life-giving word of God. A regular study of the Bible is necessary if you want to make effective use of the word of God. When Satan strikes, we need to be able to respond quickly and decisively in the word. Charles Hodge, the 18th century Presbyterian theologian said this, he said, in opposition to all the suggestions of the devil, the sole, simple and sufficient answer is the word of God. This puts to flight all the powers of darkness. The Christian finds this to be true in his individual experience. It dissipates his doubts, it drives away his fears, and it delivers him from the power of Satan. And then the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Friends, we are in a battle every day. And for us to be victorious, for us to stand firm and overcome, we must put on the arm of God every day. We live in dark and evil times. There is no truce, there is no ceasefire. The enemy does not follow any rules of engagement, has no pity, and he is relentless. We must heed the battle cry of Paul, and we must put on the armour and be ready. Now, as we go into our last point, I'm just going to read one verse, and that's verse 18. And Paul says this, Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer, and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Paul is very clear in his instruction here. He is saying, pray all the time, all kinds of prayers, with all perseverance, with all for all the saints, the four alls. What is the reason behind this? The reason for Paul's repetition of the word all is to emphasize the importance of prayer. Martin Luther says very well, he said, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Life Spring, I cannot overstate this enough. If we are to be a resilient church, a people that stands firm, a people that fights this battle as one, then we must pray. We must pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 18, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Praying for each other, we must. We need to bring our request before the King. Our needs, each other's needs. We must intercede for one another, for the nation. We must intercede for further afield. If we have eyes, and we do have eyes, if we have eyes to see, we will find a thousand things to which we can give thanks for. And another thousand situations around the world that requires God's help. There are any number of people deserving our supplications, our prayers, our family and our friends. We talked about work last week, our co-workers, our businesses, the place where we work, the church, the brothers and sisters, the flock, 
church leaders, government leaders, the person standing in line with you at the supermarket, and the person who serves you at the window at the drive through at McDonald's when you get your favorite cup of coffee. This world needs help. We need help. Friends, I need help. And we must pray at all times for every situation, for all the brothers and sisters. We as a church need to be a praying church. And that is why Sunday evening between six and seven is so important. And I want to, I want to encourage you afresh this morning to come and join us in prayer Sunday evenings. This is what the Apostle Paul is calling us to do right here. In my unit in South Africa, every morning on parade, before we started work or before we went on an operation, we would pray. You know, we would be prepared. We would be fully kitted out. We will have the armor on. We will be ready for action. And then we would pray. Brothers and sisters, just to bring this to its conclusion, for us to be a resilient family with a robust family defense in this dark world, we must be strengthened in the Lord. We cannot do this on our own. We cannot do this on our own strength. We are our strongest when we lean on him, when we surrender to our savior, our father and our creator. Number two, take up all of God's armor, every piece of it and fight for one another as one body, have each other's backs. Only then will we be sufficiently protected. And lastly, but definitely not least, we need to come before the king and ask him for help. We must remain on our knees and pray without ceasing. We must pray as one body all the time with all kinds of prayer, with all perseverance for all of the family. That's what we are. We are life spring. We are family. Charles Finney, the Presbyterian minister and leader of the Second Great Awakening in the United States said this, he says, nothing tends more to cement the hearts of Christians than praying together. Never do they love one another so well as when they witness the outpouring of each other's hearts in prayer. Amen. I would like us to respond this morning. Um, and I, as I was preparing even this morning, um, I just feel there's, there's some folks among us who might have believed a lie, um, various different lies, but there's some of us that might just feel that their past is too dark, their past is too big to bear. There might be people that just feel that they have not been forgiven. They might feel those who um, don't know God, who feel on the outside. They know God, but because of their past, because of this lie of the enemy, they feel lost. They don't know which way to turn to. Brothers and sisters, he's here. And I want to say to you, it's a lie. It is a lie. I'm going to pray for us now. But I also want to say, if there's anybody here this morning who, who's joining us maybe for the first time, who doesn't know this Jesus who we talked about, this Jesus who we build our lives upon, this Jesus who strengthened us, we'd love to talk to you. And there's people who would love to talk to you and pray with you. And Dan will later give us more information on that. But now I want to pray for us as a family. I want to pray for everyone that I spoke about earlier. I just want to say, if, if, if that resonates with you, if that's something that you feel, if you feel far away from God, if you feel not worthy, if you feel that the enemy maybe have hold of you and you can't get out, if you, you feel that you just don't know which way to turn to, God is there. God is here. God is with us. So let's, if that is you, just stand up wherever you are. You may put your hand on your heart. Tell whoever's with you, family, friends, lay on hands, brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Lord God, you have done it all. We have done nothing, but you have saved us. You've redeemed us. You've renewed us, Lord. 
We are righteous in your eyes because you have paid the price of the cross. Lord Jesus, we give thanks to you, Lord. And we are made strong in our weakness, Lord. It's when we surrender our lives to you, when we come to you and say, God, I can't do this. I don't know which way to turn. I'm caught up in this. I'm in the dark. Where are you, God? Lord, that is when we are our strongest because you are nearest. So Holy Spirit, we just pray, would you come this morning? Will you minister? Would you love, would you care? Would you wrap your arms around us? Will you give us peace? Will you restore us? Would you touch us, Lord? We need you. We need you every minute of every day, Lord. So Holy Spirit, will you come? We pray this in your mighty name. We say, thank you, God. We know you're faithful and you're an eternal God. You're never far away. You're always with us. We thank you, God. And we say, come this morning, Lord God. We pray this in your mighty name. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord.